G'day, mate. 40 here. Perhaps the most talked about new guru is on the right wing sphere is Bronze Age Pervert. And uh, from my first uh, reactions to this guy back in, in 2018, I was repulsed and simultaneously recognized his genius. Now we know more about him. He's a Romanian American who did a PhD in political science at Yale under Stephen Smith. Uh, let me play a little bit from a show we did uh, June 22, 2018 with Kevin Michael Grace and Dennis Dale. People and could have excised entire centuries, right? And this is sort of, well, we knew that, you know, that's this, what, there must be a name for this fallacy, but we see it introduced as uncertainty fallacy where people want to introduce it as if it's not, you know, it doesn't affect their side equally of whatever it is they're saying. Yeah, oh, I, just, my version of history is right. Every other, every, everyone else's version of history is, is wrong. I wanted to mention one other thing. When he writes about homosexuality, I found this quite disturbing, that uh, this openness, that the gay rights homosexuality, he seems to be particularly against. But he points to this, the hidden homosexuality, you know, the, uh, and I've been thinking about this Here because I, I just read the bio, Don Davis' uh, biography of, of Jimmy Savile and uh, an essay, which I highly recommend by Andrew O'Hagan on the Savile phenomenon and the phenomenon of uh, pedophilia at the BBC that this hidden homosexuality that, that existed before the gay rights movement was just incredibly sinister. Yeah, I can imagine. Uh, I want to weigh in here. I incredibly sinister in some instances overall. It, it wasn't incredibly sinister. There are plenty of sinister aspects of uh, heterosexuality. All right. Most, most gays <laughs> not going around acting like Jimmy Savile. I had a really hard time with the book. If uh, Kevin hadn't assigned it, I wouldn't have made it three pages. First of all, I have no idea who this guy is. So I have no, no idea why I should take him seriously on, on anything. I don't know his, his credentials, his past publishing history. Uh, he sets forward no reasons why we should listen to him. Uh, the guy hates ethics and, and ethical systems. Uh, the guy is, is not religious. His, his ethic is that of the jungle, basically, that might makes right. He glorifies piracy and tyranny. And on his uh, Twitter, Bronze Age Pervert, it's just like photo after photo of uh, barely clad men. It, it, it's really, I mean, his Twitter and his, his book are, are fairly disturbingly homo in some way that I, I don't get. And uh, here's just one quote from him, for the pervert, a life of simple barbarian freedom, however short and brutal it may be, is always preferred to the banal tedium of life or mere existence in a late stage civilization. I mean, I, I hate that. Like, for the pervert, to me, the pervert is not someone to be venerated. Uh, a life of simple barbarian freedom sounds like a horror show to me. Uh, however short and brutal it may be, I, I don't think we need, an, generally speaking, an increase in brutality. I don't think we need a glorification of, of brutality. Uh, I don't think we need a glorification of the male form. I mean, that is just gay. We don't need that crap. And then the banal tedium of life. Well, if you have friends, if you have family that you care about, if you have hobbies, life is not at all a banal tedium. So when we find out more about the guy behind uh, Bronze Age Pervert, you, you see that my early intuitions <laughs> were, were correct. Right. This guy is not someone with uh, friends, boyfriends, girlfriends, uh, thought to be living out of his car, uh, not someone with normal human connections. And so he's produced this, this grandiose exhortation, essentially, that boils down to suck my dick and treat me like a god, which is kind of similar to the vibe given off by Kenneth Brown, a.k.a. Deep Left Jerkle, and by Mencius Mordbug, a.k.a. Curtis Yavin. So Rosie Gray writes in Politico, July 16, yesterday, in 2018, Costin Alamario disappeared. There was a flurry of activity in October when Alamario, a Romanian-American writer with a PhD from Yale, published an article with Jair Bolsonaro in the Pipulous Crisis in Brazil in Palladium Magazine, an online journal associated with the anti-democracy, pro-authoritarian neo-reaction movement. Alamario announced on Twitter he was restarting his account. And he tagged far right figures like Steve Coulter and Steve Saylor and Ann Coulter. Hi, Steve. I closed my account before, but reopened to post some new articles. Hope you follow back. You might be interested in this one about Brazil, he wrote to Saylor. But on October 30, 2018, he suddenly stopped tweeting. He hasn't posted since then from that account. He hasn't published any work since then, nor has he held a job with any public profile. As far as the general public is concerned, Alamario no longer exists. But as Alamario was disappearing, another figure looking to make a name in conservative circles was on the rise. 2018 was also the year that Bronze Age Pervert, or BAP for short, became a household name in far-right circles. He built a small but loyal following by June 2018, tweeting from his account featuring a profile picture of a shirtless, well-built man photographed from behind. Self-published his book, Bronze Age Mindset, a curious mix of philosophy, polemic, and lifestyle advice. 
all in the service of the argument that embracing one's authentic masculine virtue is the only way to conquer the lower types of mankind and to root out the worst parts of democracy. So here's a sampling from the book. It goes without saying that you must lift weights. Women's liberation affects a society with a terminal disease. Readers should prepare for impending and desirable military rule in Western countries. So there's a pretty good takedown against this new paganism by Jack Butler of National Review. Operates as a form of civic religion for the political left. Less discussed, however, according to Jack Butler of National Review, is the emerging form or forms of paganism on the political right. Most prominent among them is Kostin Alamariu, a Romanian political science PhD from Yale who goes by the internet moniker Bronze Age Pervert. Alamariu is the author of Bronze Age Mindset, which Butler describes as, quote, an intentionally provocative, discursive, and ungrammatical exhortation outlining his thought. In it, Alamario laments the diminution of the authentic expression of masculinity and the masculine virtues, and the failures of political conservatism to preserve those virtues and whatever else is good about society. In ideas reminiscent of Frederick Nietzsche, Alamario castigates the, quote, bugmen or human cockroaches for their weakening of men and of society, and the need for a league of neo ubermensches to rise up and reshape the world in their image. Butler contends that, wild as all of this sounds, we should take the Bronze Age phenomenon and the rising new paganism seriously. Today, I talk with Jack Butler about the rise of this new paganism on the left and the right, and how he contends that only a reinvigorated Christianity in the public square can adequately contend with these new pretender faiths of our time. You can find... Hey, some uh, comments in the chat. Luke, will you ever do a stream on decoding Luke Ford? And Bernard said, cunt, hasn't Luke already done that directly and indirectly already? Is the critique of BAP that he is homosexual? That is what I see at most right-wing Twitter. No, the... That, that is one part of the critique. The critique of BAP is that he is anti-family, right? He's anti-women. He's, he is for tyranny. He valorizes some of the biggest ty tyrants in history. He, he wants essentially an age of strongmen, tyrants, and, and pirates running the world. And I think that's a good idea. Find additional resources in the show notes for this episode, as well as find previous episodes of Act Line on our website. Jack Butler is Submissions Editor in National Review Online, a media fellow for the Institute for Human Ecology, and a 2022-23 Robert Novak Journalism Fellow at the Fund for American Studies. He is the author of the essay Against the New Paganism for National Review, which we'll be discussing today. Jack Butler, welcome to Acton Line. Thank you for having me. So we're talking today about this piece that you had at National Review entitled Against the New Paganism. Uh, why don't we start with just give me a bit of a summation of your argument there. What are you seeing out there as this new paganism trying to supplant the role that, uh, as, as you argue here, that only a forceful reinvigoration of Christianity stands a chance against the pretender faiths of our time? What are these new pagan faiths that you see and uh, what's the landscape look like? Well, I would say I see two primarily, although not exclusively, but it would be difficult to recount all of them. There is one that I will call the left paganism. <laughs> it's funny to put it that way because you hear people talk about right liberals and left liberals. I guess now we have uh, uh, right pagans and left pagans. But the left pagans, I'll, I'll call the, this is, this is wokeness, for lack of a better term. This is the secular faith, which I actually think owes something to the cultural memory of Christianity in certain ways. It, it has retained certain of its features, but without any of the redeeming qualities of it. So in, in that sense, it, it probably more resembles a kind of Gnosticism, one of the early competitors of Christianity, and its belief in a uh, Manichaean struggle between good and evil and its vaunting of an inner spiritual core and its, and its va vaunting as well or elevating of, uh, of a spiritual elite and people capable of seeing the true knowledge. And yeah, so that, that's the... And so uh, chat says, is the critique of Bronze Age pervert that he is homosexual? No, it's that he, he valorizes uh, older men, you know, plowing younger men makes that the, the very highest thing that men could possibly achieve, wants to remove men from women and from family. Very much that uh, Bronze Age pervert is, is very much like Alan Bloom, who is just absolutely obsessed with seducing his students and speculating about whether they'd be open to gay sex. So the Bronze Age Mindset book did surprisingly well for a self-published work. It reached its highest number three on the ancient Greek history chart on Amazon. It was a word-of-mouth phenomenon. And uh, the other thing that accompanied it is the Bronze Age pervert uh, Twitter account, which was obsessed with showing photos of uh, uh, naked men, you know, unclothed men. So Razor Gay's got a good article here in Politico. He became a key figure in the world of conservative masculinity influences. Yeah, I mean, the type of people who like Mencius Moldbug, Curtis Yavin, and type of people who like Ken Brown, a.k.a. Deep Left Joe Cole, all right, type of people really into Jordan Peterson and Andrew Tate. 
yeah, it would make sense that they'd also valorize this antisocial you know, delusional narcissist. So over the past several years, this universe has gained followers and proven itself to be a reliable channel to conservative ideas and Republican politicians for young men in particular. It's a breeding ground for reactionary political ideas, clearly influenced anonymous accounts like Delicious Tacos, Raw Egg, Nationalist, and Zero HP Lovecraft. So I believe that having bonds and ties is the most important thing in the world. I would rather be around people who have a good marriage and are atheists than people who have a mediocre marriage and are religious. I have far more trust in the behavior of people who have bonds, who have you know, a good family life and, and friends and extended family than people who are isolated and religious, right? You can essentially predict the social orientation of somebody by the, the depth of their ties, particularly to family and extended family. So Bronze Age Pervert is probably the most influential anonymous right-wing account articulating the most far-reaching political and cultural vision. It's an extreme vision built around a rejection of equality, democracy, and other pro promises of modern liberalism. And his devotees include Michael Anton, former White House National Security Spokesman, Darren Beatty, former Trump White House aide. Uh, Michael Anton wrote about the book for the Claremont Institute, says that it speaks to a youthful dissatisfaction, especially young white males, where equality is propagandized and imposed in our days. Uh, Bronze Age Pervert has only grown in popularity despite being banned from Twitter for a period until late last year. Uh, Peter Thiel said he found BAP's solutions to modern problems tempting, though he disagreed with his distortions to the Judeo-Christian tradition. Republican Ohio Senator J.D. Vance follows, follows BAP on, on Twitter. So... I mean, even in however decadent uh, the West is today, there's so much worth living for. So uh, on the other hand, I did recognize some sharp insights as I pushed myself through the book very unwillingly. Uh, but I, I was like, why, why? He never gives me a reason why I should read him. But then I realized that's his, his shtick. He's just going to come but out. He doesn't, have, he doesn't have to give a reason. Yeah. No, no man that needs to give a reason. He publishes a book. You can read it or not. I asked you to read it and you read it. You know, he does come from a tradition. And this tradition begins around 1900. He mentions this word, van der Vogel. This is a tradition uh, that began in Germany and became very popular uh, on the continent. And you, you see a North American equivalent as well. You know, associated with this movement are various cults, the cult of youth. You see the cult of youth is very strong in, in this book. The cult of beauty, the cult of nature, the cult of uh, animals. And, you know, people will say that uh, this led to certain, um, the rise of fascism. It, it, it helped in the rise of fascism in the 20th century. I mean, there are, there are definite uh, connections. I mean, the, the cult of youth strikes me as particularly dangerous because it leads to a kind of ground zero thinking that we should leave aside the wisdom of the elders and the wisdom of tradition and give ourselves over to the passion of youth. Now, I mean, obviously there's a, there's a virtue to youth. I, I, I want to defend him in, in this regard. This bug man life that he talks about, it, it's terrible. This idea that we all, you, you see this movement for us to live, or presumably the elite to live, to the age of 150. You must have seen this, both of you. Yes. Oh, yeah. And by living to 150, they, they don't mean as feeble and senescent either. They mean living vigorously to 150. There's no question in my mind that if people could live to 150, the largest cause of death would be suicide. Can you imagine having to work for 130 years? That, that, just to give one example. But this idea that what's our purpose in life? To acquire things and to occupy space? Well, nobody, nobody, nobody operates under the purpose of life is to acquire things. I mean, not even nobody that I've known. I mean, for, for most people, the purpose of life is the, the development of uh, their, their relationships with their family and their friends and their community and, and their hobbies and, and their interests. I mean, it, it's a human connection that's the purpose of life. I mean, have, Kevin, have you, have you truly met people for whom the accumulation of things is their primary goal in life? Is that a serious question? Yeah. Most primary people. Goal. Most people. Yeah. This is most people today. I think that's completely wrong. I mean, seriously, you think most people today are primarily dedicated to the collection of things. Uh, most people today, as I understand them, are primarily dedicated to their families, extended families, friends, communities, and their interests and their profession. We are, this problem of scale, which he doesn't address directly in the book, has led to this atomization, the maximizing of utility. It's horrifying and disgusting. And I, I fully agree with everything he has to say about it. I mean, yeah. uh, Luke, I, I think that you have entered a, a, into a tradition which is uh, radically opposed to uh, to modern life. Absolutely. 
that this idea that we should you know move across the country leave behind our family and friends and our communities because why because it will mean more money or more status you must have really well, in much of Orthodox Judaism, they'll send their children across the world to go to a yeshiva in Israel or South America or Australia, thinking that it's good for them to learn learn in a yeshiva setting, largely apart from their families. Also, for many Chabad emissaries, the shlukim, all right, they will pick up stakes and take their family all across the world to set up a Chabad house to... You know, provide spiritual solace to any Jews that might be in the area and don't have a synagogue or don't have Jewish resources. So, yeah, family is a very high value in traditional Judaism, traditional ways of life, but it's not the only value. And there are plenty of times when people are asked to uh, sacrifice their connections to that which is familiar and to their family and extended family to go serve things of even greater value. Realized that you run into, that there was an onion story about this a few years ago, about some guy who had stayed in his hometown, you know, and was married and had a few children. And the joke of the story was that everyone understood that this guy was a jerk because who would do something like that? Instead of deciding to ooh, move to New York City and live in the village and, oh, look, you, and I saw someone famous the other day. You know, this, this constant striving, striving for. So I repeat my question. Do you know people for whom their primary purpose in life is accumulating material goods? I do not know such people. And I've known billionaires. I know millionaires, right? Everyone I know who's rich, their primary purpose in life is their family, friends, a community, and their interests. Or material goods. You know, you, 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 read, of men. you, you read of men in their man caves, <laughs> you know, and they're proud of this. But it's just, it's pathetic and disgusting. Oh, man. I don't see what's uh, discussing about having a man cave, enjoying time in a man cave, having other blokes over. I know men with man caves, they have other guys over to study Torah, to uh, watch football games, to just hang out, drink and talk. Having spaces for just men to be alone with other men, having a room in your house that's for you. I think that's a healthy thing. What, every room in the house must be equally open to... You know, everyone? I, I don't think so. Nick, you wanted, uh, what's your name today, content? My name's fine. Okay. Hi, guys. I, Hi. And I haven't read the book, but I, I tuned in just as you were sort of summarizing the book. And I wanted to ask Kevin, like, because uh, you mentioned Celine, um, and that was kind of fascinating to me. What about, like, is he like Rimbo too? I mean, is this like a late, like a decadent? Uh, well, he, is he, a yeah, he, goes, he goes into decadence. I mean, he, he lets us know that um, he likes to hang out with the wretched of the earth, or yeah. those people who made themselves the wretched of the earth. That is to say, the... Uh, you know, the whores, the sluts, the addicts, the dealers, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And he, he makes an extraordinary suggestion after quite some reasonable suggestions in the final uh, section of his book, he goes under this reverie about how, um, you know, the good guys could take over the paws, take over the filth and use it as a kind of weapon. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I always think of the line between yeah. like a romantic attitude and a decadent attitude. I mean, it's, it's a very thin line. And it seems to me like, we, I feel like in my lifetime, I've lived in a world dominated by like enlightenment, scientism, sort of uh, everything, you know, stay in your laneism, basically, like, uh, you know, pay your dues, wait your turn, the baby boomers are in charge for your whole life. And it's like, I think that this book makes sense to me if it shows up kind of um, like without credentials, but with like a raw energy uh, that, yeah, that is like maybe even decadent or romantic. And I think, I even think like, because I'm very familiar with his tweets. And I remember that whole aesthetic of the buff kind of uh, shaved chest, bronze looking uh, what, what do you call them? Bodybuilder guys. And I like I, I could be wrong about this, but I even thought that some of that was like a trolling of like of like the like Luke's homophobia, you know, which is just kind of archetypal, like a baby boomer, like kind of uptightness where like I think that it could just be a playful, fun, romantic, loud, unapologetic force. And, and what it's for is for sort of finally projecting us into the next thing, like whatever it is, we finally have to let go of, you know, baby boomerism. And, and this might be a fun way to do that. Is any of that resonate? Well, he, he puts himself inside another tradition. I don't know whether he recognizes it, which is the decadent tradition. Again, mm -hmm. roughly circa 1900. You, you see the yellow book uh, in England. You see the, uh, the symbolist poets in yeah. France, the deliberate cultivation of the derangement of the senses, yeah. uh, as it was known, to, to lead to a higher reality. Now, he mentioned... Yeah, I am probably too uptight. I need to get in touch with my Greco-Roman you know, passions for young boys, I, I, I guess. All right. Uh, back to Rosie Gray writing here in Politico yesterday. The person behind the online persona is not other than Alamario, who holds a PhD in political science from Yale. 
So when you're on the internet, a way of getting internet fame is by having extreme views and doing so consistently, authentically, and playing a role. This is Danielle Lee Thompson, who wrote a PhD on conservative influences. So she compares the way that uh, BAP operates to performance art and to Kafabi, the concept in professional wrestling of acting out stories and characters to heighten the drama of stage fights. Uh, I generally find this distasteful. It's not really my thing. So... BAP resembles folkloric tricksters who are willing to push the boundaries of polite discourse by creating a mythic character of their own, which you cannot do as a normal human being. And I think what's enabled Alamaria's transformation of himself into a mythic character is he doesn't really have many or any real world ties. He seems to be completely cut off from normal forms of human connection, which in my book is not a good thing. So his transformation from a contrarian academic to transgressive internet sensation and idol of the new right is a story of the special allure that a provocative pseudonym holds and how it can help launch a modern media celebrity and spread extreme ideas. All right, I don't think it's about the special allure here that a provocative pseudonym holds. He's a vessel for some people's fantasies of you know, getting blowjobs for a lot of young men and having you know, esoteric Greco-Roman philosophy to justify that. So Bronze Age Mindset's written in signature slang, what means W-A-T, gay, G-H-E-Y, instead of gay, grill for girl. It's a salvo against contemporary society and liberal pieties. It's a part of a chorus of trad voices gaining traction online who deplore modern society's emptiness and the replacement of traditional values with progressive ones. So uh, Ken Brown, Deep Left Joker, seems to me you know, following in, in the, the footsteps of Bronze Age pervert doing something pretty similar, wanting to start a, a cult. Which is Gnosticism. Uh, you know, you, you see a very strong attraction to Gnosticism. That is the belief that this spark of the divine that he talks about, that only a handful of people will ever be able to appreciate uh, the spark of the divine. And you have a very strong element of Manichaeism in, in his writing as well. This yeah, idea sounds, of... It sounds great to me. You know, that this tremendous uh, split in, in humanity, that this dualism... Now, I, I mean, philosophically, the book is all over the place because he seems to be, he seems to argue, for instance, near the beginning of the book, that the mind does not exist, that we are solely body. Now, how one could argue for the existence, how could one, one could demonstrate consciousness or argue for the existence of consciousness without uh, the mind? Uh, well, that's an interesting question. I mean, I think that like, uh, my understanding of, of uh, those French symbolist poets, Rimbaud and those guys, like you don't argue with them, you know? He's, it's not even an argument, it's a tone. Yeah, that's being communicated. And I it, what you're saying makes me want to read it, but I detect that you didn't enjoy it so much, which is fine. I mean, that's kind of inevitable, maybe. But you see how like you could write a manifesto of tone that would appeal to just a new wavelength. And um, anyway, so interesting choice. I'm glad yeah. you put it on the list and I'll check okay. it out. Soon. Okay. Well, no, that, you see, with the decadence. Just, well, sorry, to interrupt, just, I'll just say this quickly. With the decadence, you see a revolt against what was seen as uh, over civilization, a sissification. Yeah, if you like. Yeah. Which I think we need. I mean, I, I remember trying okay, to. Okay, wait. Let's let it up, Dennis. Dennis, you kept getting rolled over. So, Dennis, make your point. Oh, uh, oh, I was just going to say to the content. No, it, exactly what you described. I was hoping this was what the book was. I wasn't looking for it to be empirical or sound argumentation or that this sort of romantic, a literary thing, a work of art pushing forward the broader narrative. I didn't care that this guy is. I don't know who this guy is or anything else. But he failed content. Uh, you can read the book if you like, but I think he failed at it. So okay. That's exactly what he attempted to do. What I think you described. There so, is there. You know, the, the book is is overwhelming. It's it's kind of like I'll compare it to you know a disco, that you can hear the boom, 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 even before you enter, right? And as soon as you enter, you can feel that kick drum hitting your sternum, boom, 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 boom. <laughs> and you either surrender or you flee. That's what this book is like. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it I'll has it is very difficult to read, but if you if you go forward, yeah, I, I found this book uh, completely repulsive. You will find that it has a, a powerful narcotic like effect. Well, it works yes. through parts. Sorry. Well, like, I wonder if, uh, like, wouldn't you probably say similar things about Thus Spake Zarathustra? Well, exactly. It's kind of what he's attempting. Yeah. Sorry, Luke. That, and, like, the thing is, for a world, like, you know, I, I'm kind of making fun of, I mean, I think we've done this before, Luke, the thing about credentialism or, you know, I mean, I think it makes sense to me that he doesn't, it, probably he doesn't have a PhD. So. Well, it does turn out that he has a PhD and he was a very gifted student. He wrote an original PhD thesis. So. This is like a dumbed down version of his PhD thesis. You know, if, if we exist in a world where everybody has to have credentials or else we don't read them or listen to them, uh, that's one world. That's an enlightenment world. It's hierarchical. It's predictable. It's uh, stable and conservative. But every once in a while, you need a 32-year-old Alexander Hamilton and James Madison to write a brand new constitution and tell the
And uh, Luke Croft says, 40, this challenges your Judeo-Christian foundations. You can't handle the challenge. Ricardo notes, BAP really stands for bareback anal penetration, gay style. Bang the fuck off. Like, and it seems like that's kind of, I mean, I'm just from this, this guy doesn't steal the deal, though. He's all wind okay. up. He doesn't finish. Yeah. And no, that's a good so inconsistent. And, uh, you know, he's making big promises. Kevin says, you hear the bump, bump, bump. Yeah. And you get in the club. Yeah. Kevin, Michael Grace is a big fan of uh, the Bronze Age mindset book and uh, Bronze Age Pervert. You, I, you never really find the music. Okay. You well, know, that's too bad. I, I don't know. Read it. It's it's out there. I'll send you a copy. Yeah, if you read it, we'll definitely have you back on, Manic, uh, just to get, <laughs> get your take. Yeah. Uh, but uh, see, when I encounter someone, either on the written word or at the Kiddish Club or at the LA Press Club, who starts making pronouncements about Judaism, Islam, Christianity, the ancient Greeks, uh, very definitive, very strong pronouncements like uh, this Bronze Age pervert guy, it, it makes me question, like, how much do they really know? Because I. Yeah, I found the book repulsive from valorization of tyrants, the promotion of you know homosexuality of you know men taking you know younger men and essentially inducting them into sex while at the same time pretending to be all anti-gay the the slang everything about it i found repulsive i could come on here right now or i could come on here and start making all sorts of pronouncements about nietzsche mm -hmm. or i could make pronouncements about christianity or i could make pronouncements about socrates but i i wouldn't be coming from a background of depth I would just be, it would just be completely shallow, you know, things off the, off the top of my head. And uh, Luke says in the chat, 40 is using the gay stuff to discredit the rest of what BAP has to say. Well, he valorizes tyrants. I don't valorize tyrants such as Caligula. Like he, he valorizes rule by pirates, essentially. He, he valorizes military rule. And I'm sure there are times and circumstances where military rule is the best option. Overall, though, I don't think rule by tyrants, pirates, and militaries is a good way to go. I also don't hold by denigrating women and family life. I think that uh, family life is the most important thing in the world that I haven't achieved, but I still believe it's the most important thing in the world for m most individuals. And people who don't have a family life are much more dangerous and less reliably pro-social than people whose lives are interwoven with the lives of other people.